this and make big bucks, which is fine. But you need to know why did the center of mass want to make a golden mean spiral? And how would you apply that to the center of the flux density in a feedback loop in a recursion device? Right. Yeah. And, and, and matching the frequencies because you, these are frequency independent, you could match the frequencies to fit in with the pi ratios. And That's right. You I, could. I haven't done that, but I would imagine that once you got into pi ratio frequencies between right. the coils, you, you would find the most efficient. That's right. And also then you would tune that frequency to the flux time. To the flux time. So you well. flux yeah. time and golden ratio and you get it. Right. <laughs> Induction motor takes an AC current, like a three-phase motor, and so you're rotating the three phases of power around a solid rotor, and they're being sucked into place. And so the induction motors, I mean, you know, 60 to 80 percent efficient isn't too bad. Uh, so in terms of turning electric power into torque, it's not a bad thing. But if you want to get power from gravity, that's another shtick where you need this conversation. I'm just going to say these also have permanent magnets in them, which help. Can tell so about the, the in, in an induction motor, they don't have the, the permanent magnets. These have permanent magnets, which are, yep. as they move, they induce a field. So when you pass a magnetic field uh, by a conductor, then you have a current. So instead of just taking a, a solid, you know, they, well, they have plates in them, but they're like an iron core, and they, they, they use that to, to, to produce the magnetic field around. So these have magnets built in. So, 
And now that magnetic technology has gone certainly a lot farther than the 100-year-old technology of the induction motor, uh, some of these magnets get up to like 20, 30,000 gauss. So you can just turn the armature on this one and, and feel the power and the field strength of these magnets. It's huge. Tell us just quickly about the experiment that, we, that I showed you of the magnets you're telling me. Right. So, okay. So Ian did a really interesting experiment where he uh, basically had a coil coil is just an air coil, there's no core in the center, and it was fixed stationary, and then he had a 12 volt battery and a capacitor. So a large capacitor, how many farads? 10,000. 10,000 10, microfarads. microfarads. Yeah, capacitor, and charged up the capacitor, so he's got a, a standard, so that's a set amount of, that, that capacitor was so, so much power, measured in joules, and then he took one of these, um, you know, standard ceramic magnets, the kind you'd have on your refrigerator or the, the common magnets and put it in front of the coil and release that all the power from the capacitor into that coil and it moved you know what was it five centimeters or so ten, yeah. ten centimeters and then he took a, a neodymium magnet that weighed the same Double. the same weight and put it in, in front of that coil and used the exact same amount of energy to 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 propel that that uh, magnet forward Standard physicists would say, well, it's the same weight. Uh, the magnetism has nothing to do with it. It's basically the, 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 the inductive field that would come off of there. It should move the same amount, but it doesn't move like two or three times that, that distance. So permanent magnets can get pretty magical, actually. Yeah. And as the, as the ceramic materials get more esoteric, we can do more and more interesting things. Like the amount of work you get out seems non proportional. Absolutely. Therefore, does the magnet get weaker? No. So where did the energy come from? Exactly, yeah. Uh, was that gravity? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's where it's we're going. For, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if, you know, in, as a way of continuing this conversation, I was going to propose, since literally the next ha half of our day together is about the heart, heart biofeedback and the alchemy of the heart, that we might introduce that by a discussion about alchemy. <laughs> and let's see if we can apply it to the heart. Sure. <laughs> Paul is the, the hands-on alchemist of Calgary. He teaches courses in alchemy. And he actually uh, does that at Wild Rose uh, College in, in, in Calgary. And uh, so I thought we might find it uh, stimulating as we think about the alchemy of the heart to start with the discussion of, you know, some real hands-on, hard science, practical examples of alchemy. Like, would you like to tell them how you get gold out of salt or something like that? Or what? Uh, Sure. Where would you like to start? Yeah, we could, that would be good. Start with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's a whole lot of things coming uh, just around the corner. What we're finding out is that the, the standard periodic table that we have uh, really needs to have sort of a 3D matrix because uh, a lot of the elements have properties that, that are unknown. And in our standard detection uh, methods, like the resonance of the nucleus to determine what element 